do you still use it? Would you still say that email is your primary member engagement tool, though, or do, do you also do face-to-face -face meetings, or is it through social media? And what's what's working best? I mean, email is our primary tool. I mean, it allows us to move people up a ladder of engagement. Um, we get much better um, analytics on whether people are opening and how they're responding and how they're, um, you know, engaging with us and what they're reading and not. Um, um, than we do on on sort of kind of third party platforms like like uh, Facebook or Twitter. Um, you know, forty percent of our new members come to us through Facebook shares. People sharing um, petitions on pages. Um, people connecting with folks that are in their networks and saying, "Hey, I just saw this for through Color of Change. Join." Um, and um, and and you know, many of our campaigns have a face to face public sort of protest. Um, piece that is clear um, with a, also a rising um, text message um, um, community within our, with our network. And within each of those sort of areas of influence, the demographics look different, how we're communicating, what we're asking people to do, when we're, when we're asking them to do something um, is, is different as well. And so, um, you know, as you sort of expand the number of platforms that you're, that you're operating it on, you have to also expand your capacity and, and um, to be able to do it effectively. And, and really the online and offline thing, it's not a zero-sum game. Yes. They're actually mutually constitutive, and people often have trouble with that. But if you think about it, right, if you were trying to organize any event that any of you in your lives are organizing, how do you organize that event these days? Do you knock on everybody's door? No. You engage people using the technology tools that make that very efficient. So this strategy of building a big funnel in, a big community online, and then identifying the people who are prepared to meet offline is the logical strategy for our times, right? It, when we didn't have the internet, it made more sense to be really painstaking about the, the, the local organizing you did. But now, you can do local organizing more quickly if you're able to get that transition from online to offline right. But rather than being like opposites or poles or choices, they're really natural adjuncts of the same of the same strategy. And, and you know, there's, I mean, and, and just to piggyback on that, right, there are, there are still questions and, and things we have to be really concerned around around the digital divide and, and access to the internet. And so, you know, we've actually been, um, you know, playing with a number of different models to deal with the fact that not everyone has the access to the internet and not everyone is on the internet, right? And so, for instance, we were working on a, um, um, a, a criminal justice issue around closing a youth jail um, with some partners in Mississippi and um, and in Louisiana. And we've what we've done is we've we've worked with organizers, those local groups, to get the petition on on um, to, to set up a, an application where we can have the petition on smartphones for the organizers to walk door to door, um, while we also hit the list in that area and saw that in some places in the country the door-to-door -door organizers outperformed the online organizers but understanding that we have to try many different strategies to be able to give voice um, to the communities that we serve and so it's not like like jeremy said not not sort of a zero-sum game doing are you doing a lot of work with um, like texting or, or text and stuff like that yeah i mean we we send out texts a number of text messages every week um, on a variety of campaigns. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it really depends on your audience, right? Because if your audience are very active on Facebook, then obviously it makes sense to use that campaign. Mm -hmm. I mean, at Catapult, we re really believe in the power of technology to connect people, mm -hmm. and we're a very social site, and so that interaction is really important to us. But at the same time, um, we're also working on our email strategy because that can be very powerful, and our mobile strategy, and you know, whatever makes sense. To, to give you a quick example of an interesting new mobile technique. Um, globally, um, text messaging isn't working that well, in my view, in a lot of places. Um, around the world, um, a really interesting thing is happening with what's called missed calls. So Anna Hazare is an Indian anti-corruption activist, a Gandhian anti-corruption activist. He was running a big campaign in India around corruption. He initially asked people to send him a text in support of that, and he got 70,000 texts. He then said, leave me a missed call, which is a common feature of mobile phone culture in the developing world, where people call and hang up so as to register or communicate some message without incurring any phone charges. He got 35 million 
missed calls. <laughs> so we built a tool called CrowdRing to enable people to start these campaigns. So again, often it's the lowest of the low tech, just like what Rashad described. Uh, and the great thing about missed call campaigns is they're beautifully intersection of the technology and the offline. Because what you do to get a missed calls campaign going is you put up billboards and you put up posters and people go door to door. And then everybody has a phone in their pocket in these places, but they don't have a computer. So they just have to pick up their phone and for free, they leave a missed call. And then the organizer of that petition has a, a database that they can begin to engage. I love that example. Mm -hmm. it's, but I'm curious why, you know, you sort of said that you're not convinced about text message uh, as a tool. Why, why is that? Well, it depends. I mean, I think that um, for the kind of campaigning we do, it is uh, quite hard to communicate that theory of change uh, within the text message format. Um, it seems to be working better among young people in some contexts mm -hmm. here, in, here in the US. Uh, for certain types of activities. It's not easy to do the political communication that you need to do via text, and it's just people aren't used to receiving third-party texts. So by email, we're all you know, frustrated by how much third-party email we get that isn't from our you know, friends and family, uh, but that isn't the case with text. So when you try to send for someone a text message about a political issue, they're like, what the hell? So there's, it's not scaling in the West um, very well. Um, and I'm not sure it ever will. Well, I mean, I think it's helpful when people are having a unified moment. Mm -hmm. um, and so for instance, there, you know, um, sh sh once the kind of American public became really aware of, um, of uh, the death of Trayvon Martin and the fact that George Zimmerman had not um, been, been prosecuted at that point, the hoodie rallies kind of burst it out all over the country. And these rallies were, were um, distributive. They were, they were being led by local folks. And at Color of Change, we were like, nobody's there with clipboards. Nobody's capturing names. We, someone should be capturing names. So at the very least, we can go back out to those folks later and engage them in, in, a, in something deeper um, and, and more long term or something systemic or something just about the next steps around um, this case. And, and what we did was we created signage um, that we got to organizers that, that with a short code to say text Trayvon to this number. And, and we were able to get about 30,000 um, um, texts and numbers through that, which, which converted to probably be about like eight to 10,000 email addresses that we were then to, able to go back out to those folks right before the election, ask them to register to vote, ask them to do a number, turn out to vote, and, and utilize sort of the, the, the message around sort of why they first got engaged. And that's what, you know, the idea, that's what I believe cell phone use can be sort of at its best. It doesn't allow us to have long messages, but when we're having a unified moment. That's fantastic. Let's uh, shift gears a little bit. I would love to talk about lessons learned and challenges and, um, you know, what it takes to really run um, a social impact platform that has its roots in technology. Um, maybe, maybe we'll s just start there. I, I think there is sometimes a little bit of a perception amongst funders that, uh, you know, you have this great idea, you've, you've found the nexus between, you know, uh, something that's interesting to the public, it seems somewhat business viable, mm -hmm. uh, and you have the technology to support it. Um, but I think many folks might agree that it's not, you, you don't just build a site and then launch it and then you're done. And uh, there's continual iteration, it mm -hmm. takes a team. So um, talk about what, what that takes. Yeah, perhaps. I mean, I want to say this because I'm in a room full of funders, and I think it's as important. Um, <laughs> and um, um, Color of Change would not exist if our, one of our co-founders, James Rucker, wasn't a millionaire. There, there would have been no support for the idea. Um, and when the support finally came for the idea, it would have probably been five years too late. Or seven years too late. And we would have been put on timelines and um, that would not have allowed an organization like ours to prove the case in the first couple of years. And so, you know, for the first several years, James and his wife invested deeply into the organization, probably at a set, probably with seven figures for, to prove the model over that first year, over that first several years. They housed the organization out of their home and the model was proven through efforts like the work around Hurricane Katrina, around voting rights, around Gina 6. And at some point, you know, many institutional funders who have been absolutely great, many of you who are in the room, 
came aboard and began supporting Color of Change. But after we were at like 500,000 members and had sort of proven a number of different things that exist in the world. And, and, so, and, in, and so I say that to say that I'm not here, I'm not making a case for um, kind of throwing metrics out the door or evaluation or any of those things that sort of help us um, kick the tires on smart thinking and strategy. But what I am saying is, is when, we, when we think about sort of what are the next big things that are going to move us forward and give us the type of power to, to face down um, corporate and government power that's becoming much stronger and much more impactful in our daily lives, and the fact that when we look at, across a series of indicators, the, the lives and challenges of the communities that I serve, the, the numbers are not necessarily getting better. A and, and, and we can't keep doing things the same way. And so the question is, is like, you know, where do the resources come from to make that happen? And how do we think, how do we support innovative ideas that take us to the next level? I um, oftentimes get asked to go and speak about the work that I did at GLAD, the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation. And I was the head of programs there for a number of years. And people always ask, like, GLAD's work in Hollywood and how impactful it was and how people can have this experience. Like, I started seeing gay people on TV, and then I was able to talk about it with people at home who never wanted to talk about gay people. And we saw this tremendous progress. The majority, the vast majority of that, of that, um, of that was supported by individuals um, largely folks who had access to capital who were, who were funding GLAD at 1000 to 2000 to $3,000 a year out of their own pocket. Not all of our communities have that type of resource to sort of create the type of long-term strategy that made GLAD really effective. And so we just are, have to ask ourselves the questions when we look at models that have been successful like a color of change or like a GLAD or other organizations and we think about how do we replicate that. It's not just replicating the work but it's also replicating some key things that happened along the way that allowed for organizations to test out, to try, to be innovative and to fail in a culture that um, oftentimes you get one year to try to make a dent on a 400 year problem. Mm -hmm. okay,